The following program is presented by the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America and is made possible through the generous support of Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Avenir Pharmaceuticals, and the Medtronic Foundation. Hello, and welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's educational web video series, A Closer Look. In this series, we'll hear from some of the country's top MS and healthcare professionals as they offer valuable information and insights into living with multiple sclerosis. The program you're watching is Multiple Sclerosis Symptoms, Part 1. This program contains four segments. They are Effective MS Symptom Management, understanding depression and MS, learning about involuntary emotional expression disorder, and managing spasticity. Now, let's begin our program with segment one, effective MS symptom management. This segment is being supported by an educational grant from Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals. Welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's educational web video, Effective MS Symptom Management. Joining us is Dr. Jack Burks. Dr. Burks is a neurologist who specializes in multiple sclerosis. He's also a clinical professor of medicine and neurology at the University of Nevada School of Medicine, president of the Multiple Sclerosis Alliance, and chief medical officer for NSAA. Dr. Burks, welcome to the program. Our topic is symptom management, but to begin, could you give us a brief description of multiple sclerosis? MS is a disease of the brain and spinal cord the central nervous system. MS affects generally young adults in the prime of their lives. MS affects many different parts of the brain. We used to think that MS only affected the myelin or the insulation part of the brain. If we look at the brain, we have thinking cells in the top part of the brain, and we have doing cells in the spinal cord, and those thinking cells and doing cells are connected by wires, and those wires are electrical connections and those wires have to be insulated. And we used to think that MS was just a disease of the insulation and there was short circuiting, but we've learned a lot. We've learned that it's also a disease of the thinking cells, of the wires, and of the insulation. So it actually can affect all parts of brain function. Dr. Burks, what happens when someone first hears the words, you have multiple sclerosis? My style in dealing with patients when I first make the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis is not to overwhelm them with details. When they heard, hear the word multiple sclerosis, their minds tend to go blank. I reassure them that it's not a fatal disease. I reassure them that we have six treatments for this disease that we didn't have just a few years ago. And there's many ways we can deal with the symptoms of their disease. And then I bring them back when, after they've had a chance to think about it to review some material I've given them, maybe get information from the uh, Multiple Sclerosis Association for, or the MS Society, or maybe a website that I'd recommend, and then I bring them back and we talk more seriously the next time, often with their families. How does multiple sclerosis affect people? Multiple sclerosis affects different people in many different ways. There's no two patients that are exactly the same. But in general, patients tend to start MS with an attack. It might be attack of blurred vision. It may be attack of numbness. It may be attack of weakness. The patients will have symptoms, and then spontaneously those symptoms will get better. So we call the symptoms an exacerbation. We call the getting better a remission. So they have exacerbations and remissions. Then they're stable for a period of time when they have no symptoms, or they have no new symptoms. They've gotten better from their old symptoms, and now they're normal. And then they may have another attack. They'll have different symptoms. And they may recover totally from those symptoms and be stable. And then maybe the third or fourth attack, they'll have symptoms. They don't get quite all the way better. So they'll be left with some symptoms, but they're still stable between attacks. And then later on, as the disease gets more and more ingrained, the patients will start progressing between attacks. They'll have attacks, they'll get better, but then they'll progress between attacks. So the first part of the scenario is called relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis, where you have attacks, remissions, stability. And then there's progression between attacks. That's called secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. 
And then the last phase of that part of the disease is progression without attacks, just slowly progressive. They, co- they quit having attacks just every year. They're a little bit worse. Now, there are other forms of the disease as well. There's a form that affects older people. The relapsing remitting form tends to affect people in their 20s and 30s, although we can see it from age 15 to age 60. But usually it starts in the 20s and 30s. The second type of disease I want to talk about is primary progressive MS that usually starts in the 40s and 50s. It's just a slowly progressive disease from the beginning. There's not attacks. There's not remissions. Every year they're just a little bit worse. It usually affects the spinal cord, and the symptoms are usually involving in the legs. They'll have numbness and stiffness in their legs, and it'll slowly work the way up. So those are the major types of multiple sclerosis. And depending on where the damage occurs, that determines the type of symptoms they have, because they can have any type of symptom depending on where the damage is. Obviously, that if the damage is in the eye, they may have decreased vision. If the damage is in the area that controls strength, they'll have decreased strength. And every attack can occur in a different part of the nervous system. So you can see any type of symptom with multiple sclerosis. Can you talk about some of the more common symptoms associated with multiple sclerosis? There are many symptoms uh, seen in multiple sclerosis patients. The symptoms vary from more common symptoms, such as fatigue, numbness, stiffness or spasticity is what the doctors call that, balance trouble, um, pain, um, bowel problems, bladder problems, sexual dysfunction, uh, depression, memory problems, uh, the ability to control their emotions sometimes. Um, So there are many, many symptoms, swallowing problems, speaking problems. Depending on where the damage occurs in the brain, you'll have different symptoms. Now, even when someone has a symptom, it can be very different. Like some patients can have fatigue that is absolutely overwhelming. And some people have fatigue that's not badly bad at all. Some people have muscle weakness that is severe, and some people have muscle weakness that I can tell in my examination, but they can't even tell. So every patient is different. Every symptom is different. And that's why I think it takes a really good neurologist to be able to put those into perspective to be us to be able to help the patients. How does someone with MS begin to understand and manage all of these different presenting symptoms? For a patient to get a handle on the disease and handle these various symptoms requires information. The patients need to understand what causes the symptoms. Are these symptoms related to MS? Are these symptoms related to something else? For example, fatigue is very common in MS, but fatigue is also common in things like depression, anemia, thyroid problems, low blood sugar. So the first thing we have to do is, is this multiple sclerosis? Or could this be something else? So just because you have MS doesn't mean that everything is caused by your MS. So how do you handle those? Well, the first thing is understanding the symptom, talking to your doctor about the symptom, uh, getting a good rapport with the doctor saying, doctor, what does this really mean? And, and can I, I'm having fatigue. Can I play tennis? What is, how is this going to affect me? If I play tennis, will my fatigue get a lot worse or will I get in better shape and my fatigue be less? To understand that. This example of exercise brings up another point about heat intolerance. Some patients can tolerate lots of exercise, and some patients who get heated up during exercise, or even just from the sun, have less ability to function. So for those patients, we would recommend some sort of cooling device, uh, for example, to keep the body temperature lower. Or if you're going to walk on the beach, walk on the beach in the early morning when the sun is not so hot. And some people can walk a mile on the beach in the morning, but can only walk a few hundred feet on the beach in the afternoon. So the body's temperature regulation is very important to MS patients, and that when the temperature gets elevated, often the symptoms of MS feel worse. One of the keys to understanding how symptoms affect people is to keep a journal. And that I recommend the patients journal their symptoms of the disease so they have a better understanding. So they become more specific about what's happening because that really helps them communicate with their doctor better. If a patient comes in to me and I say, how are you doing? They say, I feel terrible. 
I just had a bad few months since I've seen you last, doctor. That helps, but doesn't help me specifically. However, if they can say, doctor, referring to my journal, I had three episodes that lasted two weeks each of numbness in my left side. And then I had an episode three months ago where I was decreased vision in my right eye. I didn't want to bother you about it, but I thought you should know about that. And then there was this one other episode I had that lasted for four weeks, doctor, when I was dragging my right foot. See the difference between understanding what's going on, because that helps me as a doctor understand that patient probably had a number of attacks, as opposed to the kids were giving him a hard time or they were having a hard time at work and they were just feeling miserable, like all of us feel at certain times. You mentioned that it's important for patients to have a better understanding of their symptoms and to know their body's limitations, but are there also medications to help treat the various symptoms of MS? Every symptom of MS is usually handled differently. There are different medications, and there are many medications that can help the symptoms of MS. Uh, the medication we would use for one symptom would maybe be very different than the medication we'd use for another symptom. Rehabilitation treatments are often very helpful in, uh, in treating symptoms. For example, if patients have pain in MS, if they have the type of pain that, that comes from the central nervous system or from the brain itself, the medications for epilepsy are often very helpful. At the same time, if they're having pain because they have a little bit of weakness on one side and they're limping and they've got, they throw their back out, well, the treatment for that is very different. We use rehabilitation techniques to strengthen the muscles in the back. So therefore, tr treatments are available, but they vary depending on the symptom and depending on the cause of that particular symptom. What about the issue of side effects from medications? One of my responsibilities as their physician is not only to explain the potential benefits of any treatment, but also potential side effects and any dangers. It's also important for the patients to understand that as well, so they may want to get their own information and talk to the doctors about what they can expect in terms of side effects and dangers. There are also dangers when you combine medication, and therefore that's a legitimate question to ask your doctor. Uh, will this medication interfere with the medications I take for whatever other condition they might have? What are your thoughts on patients taking complementary and alternative medicines to help manage their MS symptoms? Discussing complementary and alternative medicine options with my patients is very difficult. First, because they don't want to tell me about it, because they think I might not accept them. If, if I were, they were doing something like that, I might not approve. Well, the worst possible scenario is if a patient is taking an herb from China and they don't tell me about it. And if I knew about it, I could find out that herb from China actually interfered with one of the medications they're taking for the multiple sclerosis. So it's incredibly important to tell your doctor what you're taking and let the doctor do his investigation to see, could there be an interference? There are many types of complementary and alternative medicines. Many MS patients take the Western medicine, the disease-modifying therapy, and they also do lots of other things in the complementary field, such as yoga, tai chi, massage. There are so many different ways to help one's body, not just through the medications that the doctor writes on a prescription blank. So therefore, I am very supportive of many of the uh, complementary medicines. I am not very supportive of medications that help the immune system because multiple sclerosis is a disease where the immune system is overactive. And I think that's the last thing my patient should take is something that should help the immune system become more active because I think it may cause harm. So therefore, we have to weigh each and every medication and herb and other treatment that the patient's considering and put that into perspective with their disease and the current treatments they're on. And it needs to be a partnership between the patient and the doctor. And there cannot be a partnership if the patients don't tell the doctors what they're on. So that should be part of the agreement of the partnership to make certain that each side lets the other side know what's going on. How can patients know if their symptoms are being managed properly? Patients want to know how the treatment's working. How, are they getting the maximum benefit from the treatments? 
And, the, and that's a very difficult question to a- answer sometimes. Because first of all, we have to have realistic expectation. Between the doctor and the patient, they need to talk about how long it should take for this particular treatment to work, what that result would be, what would be the best results, what would be an acceptable result. And if the results are not acceptable within a reasonable period of time, what we're going to be able to do to change that treatment. So it's, it's a partnership between the patient's understanding what are the ex- realistic expectations and the doctor explaining those in a reasonable time frame so that they can then make modifications of treatment if necessary. Establishing a good relationship with your doctor is incredibly important and also can be incredibly difficult. We all have different styles of how we communicate with people. You need to find out what your doctor's style is and is it compatible with your style? For example, does a doctor feel that he should try to return your phone call within an hour, a day, a week, or when he gets around to it? Well, my style would be that if a doctor isn't going to get back to me that day or the next day, he, his style and my style are incompatible, and it's probably better for me to find another doctor who has a style more closely resembling mine. Um, also, the style of, of how you ask questions, how you present information, how you prioritize what you want to talk to the doctor. I recommend my patients make lists. And they'll sometimes bring in a list of 10 or 15 things they want to talk about. And my first question to them is, which ones are the most important? So we prioritize. What is the most important things? The other things we can cover later, or maybe we can cover them more briefly. Uh, What is the most important thing to my patients? And that's why the journal can be important. And I even have some of my patients bring a tape recorder because have you ever been to the doctor and, and you remember the questions you asked but you can't remember the answers the doctor gave you? Well, that happens to be whether you have MS or not. And so my strong belief is you need to make sure you understand the answers from the doctor and you'll be able to follow up on those answers. And you could be in the doctor's office for three or four hours if you had enough questions. So you have to prioritize. The doctor only has a certain amount of time. He's got a waiting room full of patients. And so it's up to the patients to, to say, what is really important to me? What could, information could I get from the Internet or from the Multiple Sclerosis Association, etc.? And what do I really need to talk to the doctor about? Can I talk to the nurse about these? Can I talk to about my psychologist about these? What are the things that I want to talk to my doctor? And try to focus in, in that area and have someone come with you that can help you with the answers or bring, a, or bring some sort of a tape recorder so that when you get home, you can actually listen more in depth about what the doctor had to say. And finally, Dr. Burks, what are the key points to effectively managing multiple sclerosis? The first step is staying on top of this disease, understanding the new information and utilizing that new information as, and, and incorporating how the MS affects me and how does that new information help me deal with the disease better. The second very important thing to learn in multiple sclerosis is learning how to adapt to change. Because we all have changes in our lives, and if I had multiple sclerosis, I'd want to make sure that I was very capable of adapting to that change. And that actually might include some counseling to help me develop those skills better. Also, coping with the disease. We can't change many of the things that happen in the disease. We can change how we cope with those and coping with stress. We all have stress, whether we have MS or not. But with patients with MS, I think dealing with stress is critically important for their well-being. So learning good stress management techniques, whether it's um, self-hypnosis or biofeedback or visual imagery or whatever we want to use, these are inexpensive, easy-to-learn techniques that can help us deal with stress, cope with the disease, and learn how to adapt to changes in our lives. The next step is human nature. When we have an adversity, we tend to get down. And what I try to work with my patients is to keep them up, keep them can do, not what I can't do, but what I can do. And when they have that attitude, it's amazing what they can do. I mean, I have patients who are skiing, who are scuba diving, who are living great lives, who were told they could not do that because they had multiple sclerosis. So a can-do attitude is really important. At the same time, 
we just can't ignore signs of depression. If we're feeling down, we have to recognize there's something going on here that I'm having trouble dealing with. It might be anxiety, it might be depression, but something's not working right. Recognize that, bring it up to the doctor, and ask for help. There are medications that can help, but also counseling can be very important in dealing with depression and anxiety and other emotional reactions to getting multiple sclerosis. One of the next things I really try to get patients to do is not hibernate. It is so easy. You know, I've got this disease. I'm just going to go and sit inside all the time. I'm not going to do this activity and that activity. They give up their friends. They stop communicating with their families. And so I think it's really important to stay active, stay involved, stay focused, keep your goals in life. Because if you keep those goals, you have an overwhelming chance of, of succeeding in those goals. The next thing I think that it's important is to take care of yourself. It's great to have good doctors. It's great to have good MRIs. But if you don't take care of yourself, what's it worth? You've got to be able to, to keep exercising, keep good nutrition, take care of yourself, learn your safety zone. I can abuse my body so much, I'm not going to exceed that if I can help it. Sometimes we do. Sometimes instead of, you know, if, if you're used to staying out till 1 o'clock in the morning, maybe you ought to go home at 10 o'clock and try that. Uh, and if you stay out till midnight and you're really tired the next day, the next time maybe then go back to 11 o'clock. Learn. The key is, is to learn what you can do to help yourself. And many of the things I've talked about is about helping yourself. It's not just depending on the doctor to give me a medication for MS that's going to cure me and I don't have to do anything for myself. You must work with the doctor. We are very fortunate in the multiple sclerosis world that we have treatments for MS. In 1993, we had no treatments for multiple sclerosis. Now we have six approved by the FDA. But these treatments only help people who take them. So therefore, the idea of getting on a medication early in the disease at the first sign of MS is critically important because the medications for MS, we call them disease-modifying therapies, are, can be very successful if patients take them early in the disease. If they wait for 10 or 15 or 20 years to take them, they don't work as well. So the big push now by most MS experts, including myself, is that I try to put patients on medications as soon as possible. We have a variety of medications that might be helpful. You need to talk to your doctor about which ones might be right for you. But the key is don't say, well, I'm doing fine now. I've had an attack. I'm better. I'm not going to get treatment until I'm halfway into a wheelchair because the treatments don't work as well. Then we must prevent the damage because right now none of the treatments repair the damage. So we're talking about prevention here which means you must be on medication. Another very important issue besides taking disease modifying therapies which are critically important is not to ignore one's symptoms. The, the, the treatments for the symptoms of MS are usually very successful. Maybe not 100% successful, but they can help enormously. But you must talk to your doctor about your symptoms and ask, what can I do about these symptoms? I have had so many patients who've come to me who've had fatigue for three years who said, well, I'm on disease-modifying therapy, but I still have fatigue. Well, there are treatments for fatigue as well. So you use disease-modifying therapy plus treatments for fatigue and we can go down the list. Treatments for spasticity or, or stiffness are very important as part of the general treatment regimen. So it's not just disease-modifying therapy that's important. You must treat the symptoms if you're, gonna, if you're going to live your life with a maximum quality of life. One of the things I like to remind my patients, and my friends who don't have MS, by the way, is that happiness is a state of mind, not a state of health. It is amazing to me how well-adjusted and happy people are, even if they have severe MS and they might be in a wheelchair. But if they have a good family life, if they're feeling productive, if they're feeling creative, life is good for them. My take-home message is focus on what makes you happy and fulfilled, and your quality of life will be much better. That's a great message for us all. 
Well, that concludes this segment on effective MS symptom management. On behalf of MSAA, I would like to thank Dr. Jack Burks for his comprehensive knowledge and insight on this topic, and Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals for its support of this segment. This program is being supported by an educational grant from Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's educational web video, Understanding Depression and MS. Joining us today is Allison Shaddy, a medical clinical social worker and an expert in the field of counseling chronically ill patients and their families. Ms. Shaddy is also a person living with MS since her diagnosis in 1995. Ms. Shaddy, welcome to the program. Can you tell us a little about your professional career and how MS came into your life? Sure. Um, about 14 years ago, I was working as a medical social worker in home health. And at the time, I was actually caring for many MS patients. Uh, ironically, around that time, I began to be bombarded by a, a series of my own neurological symptoms. Um, this included optic neuritis, uh, numbness on my right side, extreme vertigo. Uh, I was having difficulty driving with my right foot because of uh, weakness in my calf. And being a medical social worker, I recognized that these could very well be symptoms of MS, which was actually really terrifying for me. Um, I was 33 years old at the time. Uh, but I felt I needed to go ahead and pursue this. I set up an appointment with a neurologist. I had an MRI completed, and in fact, the diagnosis was confirmed. And I want to be very candid about how I responded to this um, because I think it's very validating for other folks who may be going through the same thing. Um, I went from overnight from being a caregiver to a patient, and uh, this wasn't a comfortable role for me at all. And um, basically... I went through probably the toughest year of my life that first year adjusting to the fact that I had multiple sclerosis. Um, I did seek therapy. I did get on antidepressants. It took me about a year to really integrate uh, the concept of having MS into my life and to catch up psychologically with the diagnosis. Uh, but I came out the other end of it after about a year and uh, felt that I had really learned a lot and also had a unique perspective that I could offer other people who might be going through the same thing. Um, I developed a level of empathy and compassion that I don't think a lot of other mental health professionals necessarily had, having not gone through a similar experience. So I started a private counseling practice specializing in treating folks who were also dealing with uh, the emotional impact of chronic illness. And um, I've treated since that time hundreds of patients with MS and their families. And I've learned a great deal from my patients. They've been incredibly inspiring people. Um, in fact, uh, what has come out of all that is I've written a book called MS in Your Feelings, Handling the Ups and Downs of Multiple Sclerosis, which just came out a couple of months ago. Um, and it's really a, a compilation of all the things I've learned and that the patients have taught me about how to live well with this disease and handle the emotional impact. Our topic is depression and MS. I think so many of us may confuse sadness with depression. Can you explain the difference between the two? Well, there is a significant difference between sadness and depression. Sadness is a, a very normal and typical emotion that we will all experience at some point during our lives. It's um, a reaction in proportion to an event that's occurred, a loss or a tragedy, and generally it lasts for a few days, and then we get back to feeling our normal selves and regain our spirit. Depression is another animal. Um, actually, when we feel depressed, a lot of folks don't really know even why they're feeling that way. Uh, there may not necessarily be an actual trigger that causes the depression. When patients come into my office, they'll throw their hands up in the air and say, I don't know why I'm depressed. Um, the other significant difference is that depression is going to last a lot longer than sadness. What are the different types of depression and their respective symptoms? 
There are a few different types of depression. Uh, the one that people are most familiar with is the major depressive episode. Um, generally, you will experience about five different uh, clinical symptoms, that, and those will be required to actually have a diagnosis of a major depressive episode. Those might include feelings of extreme fatigue, folks may have difficulty getting out of bed, um, feelings of hopelessness, worthlessness, low self-esteem, uh, a general depressed feeling, you know, just not being able to enjoy activities any longer, maybe a change in your weight, appetite, uh, feelings of restlessness, agitation, and the most serious is uh, feelings of either suicide or wanting to harm others. And generally, you'll experience these uh, symptoms for at least two weeks or longer. The next type of depression that people aren't as familiar with is called dysthymic disorder. And I describe this as more of a low-grade but chronic type of depression. This generally lasts two years or longer. And oftentimes, people aren't really even aware that they're experiencing this depression because it's, it's insidious and it lasts for such a long time. They begin to think that this is their normal state of mind. Uh, the symptoms will be similar uh, to what you would see in a major depressive disorder. However, they may not be as severe. Often with major depressive disorder, you're going to have trouble actually functioning, you know, getting out of bed and what have you. With dysthymic disorder, um, you're generally able Able to uh, function and you know, get along in life, but you're really not enjoying it at the level that you should be or could be. The other type of depression is what we call bipolar disorder or manic depressive disorder. And this is what it sounds like. When someone has a manic episode, um, they have a tremendous amount of energy. They may not require really any sleep at all. They have sudden bursts of extreme creativity, but also very inappropriate behavior. You may see uh, compulsive gambling, inappropriate sexual activity, um, wild spending spree sprees, and then people People crash and they come down and that's the the depressive side of the manic depressive and then again you're going to see the depressive symptoms that I've already mentioned um, in addition there's one other uh, sort of unique depressive incident that you can see with people who have MS and that's called IEED that is uh, basically affects about 10% of people with MS and um, it's not really clinical depression but it's an inappropriate response to external events where people may cry uncontrollably or laugh uncontrollably and this may have no uh, relation whatsoever to the external events that are going on. So that's another sort of lesser known um, emotional reaction to the disease. Can you talk about the prevalence of depression in the general population as well as within the MS community? Generally, about 10% of the population um, is really prone to experiencing depression at some point in their lives. That comes to about 18 or 19 million people in the United States who will at some point experience depression. I recently saw a statistic by the World Health Organization that said 121 million people worldwide will at some time experience a depressive episode. However, when you look at MS patients, the risk is extremely high. Up to 50% of people will experience depression at some time during the course of their illness. Um, and this really puts us at a much higher risk than the general population. So why are MS patients at such a high risk for depression? The easy answer when you ask why are MS patients at a higher risk for depression is to just say, well, why wouldn't they be? It's a very challenging disease. It affects us on every level, every aspect of our lives. But again, that is the easy answer. When you look at uh, folks with other chronic illnesses that are equally as disabling or even more disabling than MS, we don't see as high an incidence of uh, depression in those folks. So then we have to sort of look a little deeper and ask a few more questions. So why is it that it's higher with folks who have MS? Um, and there are several factors. There's still a lot of research going on around this area. Um, people who have MS are often taking a lot of medications. Sometimes these medications can make you more susceptible to depression, um, especially steroid treatments. Oftentimes when you're on steroids, you're going through the roof while you're on them, but then when you are taken off, you can really crash. If you have a predisposition to depression, you're going to be at a higher risk at that point. Um, more research is being done now also in terms of how disease activity may actually cause depression. 
if you are having lesions and disease activity in a certain part of the brain that affects mood, it's a natural conclusion that that may also give you a depressed mood or influence you in some way emotionally. What are some of the ways depression affects people with MS? Depression affects people with MS on many different levels, just as MS affects people on many different levels. Um, it can put a terrible strain on families and relationships. I often have family members who come in and they say, you know, I've learned to live with the MS symptoms. I can handle the physical stuff, but I can't live with her while she's depressed. You need to fix this. Uh, so it can really challenge relationships. Um, it can impair sexual desire. Um, it can make people become very isolated, and that in turn makes family members feel shut out and disconnected. Um, in severe depression, folks may not be able to take care of themselves. Getting up out of bed can seem an, like an overwhelming task. Taking a shower, preparing a meal, caring for a child, all of these things can feel impossible when you're really under a cloud of depression. Uh, when people describe what it feels like, they say exactly that. I feel like I'm in a dark cloud or that a dark cloud has invaded every cell in my body. It's shutting out hope. It's shutting out any feelings of excitement or uh, future, you know, possible happiness. And that's a, that's a big issue for people because this hopelessness and this feeling that it's never going to get better is really damaging. Um, but that's true for most anyone who has depression. Where it becomes even more dangerous for folks with MS, in, in my opinion, is that um, when you're depressed, you're much less likely to comply with your medications. Uh, you're less likely to make it to your doctor's appointments. Um, the idea of getting exercise or eating well, getting good sleep, all of those things are going to be much harder to do when you are also challenged with depression. So you're putting your MS symptoms at a higher risk when you're depressed. Also, I talked a little bit about how you suffer from fatigue, um, also cognitive difficulties, insomnia. These are signs of depression, but they also mimic symptoms of MS. So if you've got these symptoms anyway and you overlay depression on top, you're really getting a double dose of trouble. Um, I've also had patients come into my office who would say, you know, the MS is causing me to have these cognitive difficulties, it's causing fatigue. And lo and behold, when we treat the underlying depression, the MS fatigue and uh, cognitive difficulties disappear because, in fact, they were related to the depression all along. I think it's great that we're learning so much about this topic, and I'm sure our viewers want to know, is depression treatable? Well, now we're getting to the good news. Depression is very treatable. In fact, it's one of the most treatable of all MS symptoms. But I want to emphasize, you must let someone know that you are depressed to get the treatment. And this is a stumbling block for a lot of people. Unfortunately, even in this day and age, there's still a stigma attached to mental illness in our society. And what I find is it's often very difficult for patients to raise this issue with their physicians, particularly, especially they would need to talk to their neurologist about it if they're even if it's mild um, when they have these emotional symptoms they have to take the responsibility to bring it up or else it'll never get treated on the flip side Physicians are just like humans, just like all of us, and oftentimes they're more comfortable talking about the physical symptoms, and so they're not as likely to ask about the emotional aspects of the disease. When you walk into a doctor's appointment and you have MS, there's going to be a host of physical things to focus on. So it's really up to us to, to raise our hand and let our physicians know when we are experiencing the different symptoms of depression. If it's tough for you, what I would suggest is writing it down. You know, uh, just if it's difficult to say it face to face, get out a piece of paper, write down what some of the symptoms have been, and share it with your doctor that way. That's the only way you're going to end up getting help for your depression. So now that we have the good news that depression is treatable, what are the various types of treatment? Whether you're suffering from mild, moderate, or severe depression, the first line of attack is generally to look at antidepressant medications. And that would mean talking to your doctor about the different options that are available to you. Uh, fortunately, we've made a lot of progress over the last several years in terms of antidepressants and our ways that we treat depression, um, just as we have with MS medications. So that's the good news. 
All the studies and research indicate, however, that antidepressant medication alone is never as effective as working with a counselor in conjunction with uh, the medical treatment. And there are several options out there for folks. You can talk to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a social worker, a counselor. It really doesn't matter what the profession is or what the degree is. However, if you're um, really dealing with a lot of complicated medication issues, I would recommend talking to a psychiatrist because they are able to do med management and work with people in terms of prescribing medications. Where I think the important uh, piece comes in is really the, the feeling that you have when you're with this other person. You want it to be a good fit. You want to feel that your counselor is listening to you, that they're understanding your concerns, that they're empathetic. Um, all of these things are critical in terms of you being comfortable and sharing your innermost feelings. Uh, the other thing that I think is very important is if you can find some type of mental health professional who has a background in treating people with chronic illness, and if you can find someone that knows a little about MS, that's even better. Um, oftentimes your neurologist will have a list of practitioners in the area that they've worked with that they can refer you to. Uh, many of the local MS Society chapters also have lists of folks who have gotten training in multiple sclerosis and are also mental health professionals that they can refer you to. So those two things, the uh, medication and therapy in conjunction with each other are very important. I would like to make a point, however, when you start on an antidepressant medication, it often takes four to six weeks for it to begin to take effect, to actually get into your system. So don't give up. Don't take a few pills, say it doesn't work, and walk away. Um, you, you need to stick with it, and sometimes the first choice of uh, treatment isn't effective, and you may need to experiment and work with your doctor to try other methods. But I can assure you it is worth working towards because once that depres depression lifts, you are going to feel such a great amount of relief. It's going to be worth the effort. And finally, Ms. Shetty, what are some of the positive steps people can take to manage and treat their depression? I think it's important for patients to know that there are many steps they can take themselves to relieve some of their depressive symptoms and also to just simply live well with this disease. Uh, I encourage folks to be proactive, to get information, to get on the internet, to learn all they can about MS. Um, attending educational events, there are many of them out there, um, from the drug companies to MSAA to the MS Society. All these folks are, are putting out events that are available. Normally, they're free of charge. So I encourage people to take advantage of those um, different educational opportunities. The other great benefit of that is that you get to meet other people with MS. And this is um, a, a huge relief for people when they actually get to connect with other people who are going through similar problems as they are. Um, I think that oftentimes MS patients feel very misunderstood. This is a, a difficult disease because oftentimes the uh, symptoms are invisible. So people look at you and they think that you're just fine when actually you may be suffering from a variety of different symptoms. Um, and so there can be a lot of misunderstanding. But when you're sitting down next to someone else who also has the disease, it can be very therapeutic and very healing to do that. Um, sometimes you can develop relationships that will continue on after the event, you know, and you can help to support each other. Um, there are also, you know, simple things like eating well and exercise, um, maintaining a good sense of humor, and simply staying connected to others, whether it's your family, your church, your community. Um, over and over again, the people that I see that really handle this disease the best and cope with it the best are the ones that stay active, stay involved, and stay connected. Thank you so much. Well, that concludes this segment on understanding depression and MS. On behalf of MSAA, I would like to thank Allison Shaddy for sharing her expertise on this very important topic, as well as Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey for supporting this program. This program is being supported by an educational grant from Avenir Pharmaceuticals. Welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's educational web video, Learning About Involuntary Emotional Expression Disorder. Joining us is Dr. Daniel Wynn, Director, Clinical Research, and Co-Director, Consultants in Neurology, MS Center in Chicago. 
Dr. Wynn, welcome to the program. Can you briefly describe the condition known as IEED? Involuntary Emotional Expression Disorder, or IEED, is a neurologic symptom in patients with illnesses such as multiple sclerosis, stroke, or head injury, where a person will experience involuntary episodes of emotional expression, crying, laughter, or irritability. In the past, neurologists commonly used the term pseudobulbar affect, psychiatrists commonly used the term emotional ability or emotional incontinence. The term involuntary emotional expression disorder was chosen as it's somewhat more precise and less pejorative. More strictly accurately defines the condition where patients truly have involuntary expression of emotion as a consequence of a neurologic disorder as opposed to a primary mental illness. When patients experience periods of crying or other emotional responses, they may relate it to depression. How can patients know what they are experiencing as IEED? A common confusion is confusing IEED and depression. In depression, the mood is always congruent. It always goes along with the symptoms at hand. If something If a person feels sad, they will cry. Sometimes in IED, people will laugh at things that are otherwise sad. As an example, a young woman we care for, who when a close friend of hers died and she was at the funeral, couldn't stop laughing, was humiliated by this and quickly ran to her car at the cemetery. This is something that a depressed person would not do. Depression is common in MS response to therapy for depression, the medications and psychotherapy is helpful. But when you're not responding to therapy, an important question to ask, is there something here more than depression or instead something completely separate? Dr. Wen, you mentioned one example of IEED behavior. Can you give us another example? A man I take care of who's a minister, who has ministered to people at very difficult times throughout his life, got to the point where he couldn't even drive in the car with the radio on without causing uncontrollable weeping. So sometimes things occur, which you might anticipate crying at a funeral, but uncontrollably so, or laughing at a funeral, which wouldn't be expected, or an individual who normally spent his entire life administering to others at their difficult time, finding himself even uncontrollable, unable to control his emotions at simple stimuli, little listening to the radio in the car. How can patients become more aware of the symptoms of IEED? Some symptoms of multiple sclerosis are more obvious than others. If suddenly I was dragging my foot, suddenly I couldn't see out of my eye, I'd go to a doctor. Although sometimes people have other symptoms which are less obviously related to their MS. One of them is involuntary emotional expression disorder. You know, you're not having new trouble weak with weakness. There's no sudden change in fatigue, but suddenly you're snapping at people. Suddenly at the most minor stimuli, you're having these episodes of crying, which may come on explosively that you can't control. They may occur in response to a stimulus, or may just appear out of the blue that you find yourself crying at your desk. When you have a symptom like this, realize that this is not normal. This is something which there is help for. This is not a symptom you have to simply learn to live with. Dr. Wen, what is the cause of IEED? The cause of IED is still incompletely known. We know that emotion often comes from deep structures inside the brain, whereas the frontal lobe of the brain is very important in controlling when we cry and when we laugh, for example, when we express our emotions. This flows to the brainstem, the back of our brain, to control the movements of our face when we cry or laugh. If there's a disconnection between these two areas, from a lesion in the brain from MS, then people will have that thought of sadness or happiness or laughter and immediately express it in a situation where ordinarily one wouldn't. For example, when we're you know, three or four years old and someone pokes us, we maybe turn around right away, or someone tickles us, we laugh right away. It doesn't matter if we're in church or in a bedroom with our closest friend. Then we get to be five or six years old and someone poked me from behind. I waited till recess and then I poked him back at the playground. In MS, if a lesion occurs in that area, one will quickly respond to it in a way which one wouldn't have before. One would have censored the expression of that emotion. How this occurs in the brain has a lot to do with the different neurotransmitters or chemicals in the brain. An imbalance occurs when lesions occur in certain parts of the brain, resulting in the condition we now refer to as IEED. 
How does a physician diagnose IEED? To get diagnosed with involuntary emotional expression disorder requires both you giving the history to your doctor if you're having symptoms like this, but also having a doctor who is seasoned clinician in taking care of patients with MS and other neurologic illnesses. It's important for them to think, maybe this is something other than depression. In MS, depression may occur in as many as half of individuals. IED may occur in as many as 20% of individuals with MS. One can have both depression and IED. They can occur together, they can occur separately, and they require sometimes different treatment. There are some scales that can be used, the Central Nervous System Liability Scale, or CNS-LS, and the PLAQS scale, Pathological Laughter and Crying Scale. These scales, which have primarily been used for research, are easy scales to see on the Internet and to just score yourself. They're simple. It's a scale with very simple questions. Do you find yourself laughing at times when there's nothing really funny going on? Do you find, you have, find yourself crying and can't control the crying? Simple questions like this are characteristic of it. They're very simple questions to ask. When we teach medical students each year how to do physical examination, I always look forward to them asking me one question. They always ask, which stethoscope should I buy? And I answer, it doesn't matter which stethoscope you buy, it's whose ears you put it on. For individuals with MS with a symptom of pathological laughter or crying, it's important for your doctor to learn to listen for this in the same way that a cardiologist may listen for a particular murmur. Are there drugs available to treat IEED? Although there are no FDA-approved drugs specifically indicated for IEED, commonly as physicians will use the antidepressant medications. While not specifically targeted to this condition, they often have a significant benefit for individuals with this condition. Don't worry, however, have hope. There are other medications on the way which are being targeted specifically to this condition, specifically designed to treat the neurochemical imbalance that often occurs from lesions in certain areas of the brain. What can MS patients and their families do to help manage their IEED? The most important is simply to learn about it and to learn to recognize it. If your loved one has IED and they snap at you or are crying uncontrollably, don't necessarily come to their aid with a large handkerchief or run the other direction. Recognize this symptom, like certain other odd symptoms in MS, can be a symptom of MS, and it's not necessarily personal. Usually when our spouse snaps at us, we assume they're angry. This is not necessarily a sign of anger. Prolonged uncontrollable episodes of crying are not necessarily a symptom of depression, that something is wrong, other than what's wrong is having MS. This too can be a symptom of MS. When one has new symptoms in MS, whether or not it's involuntary emotional expression or disorder, or new motor weakness, tremor, or other neurologic symptom, one would want to talk to one's doctor and find out, is there something I can do about this to help make this go away? One thing that patients can do to minimize the disability from MS is to become educated. Educational programs, such as by the MS Association, can help us learn to recognize more symptoms, both patients as well as doctors, so we can provide more specific, exact therapy. One of the marks of medicine is a more precise diagnosis can lead to a more accurate and more effective therapy. Dr. Wen, thank you so much for being here and for shedding some light on this lesser-known symptom of multiple sclerosis. On behalf of MSAA, I would also like to thank Avenir Pharmaceuticals for supporting this segment on learning about involuntary emotional expression disorder. This program is being supported by an educational grant from the Medtronic Foundation. Welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's educational web video, Managing Spasticity. Joining us is Dr. Donald Barone. Dr. Barone is Clinical Associate Professor, University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey School of Medicine. He is also Director of the MS Center of South Jersey and a member of MSAA's Healthcare Advisory Council. Dr. Barone, welcome to the program. Can you give us a brief description of spasticity? Spasticity is a neurological condition that results when there is 
an abnormality in the central nervous system that is either the brain or the spinal cord affecting those nerve fibers that control motion, the, the motor nerves. Uh, ordinarily, uh, there is exquisite control of muscle and when a patient makes a gesture or reaches for something, the muscles work in, in perfect harmony. When there is spasticity, th this perfect harmony is disrupted and muscles that might extend an arm out or flex it back toward the patient might fight one another. And so there's a lot of increased tone and a lot of effort and a lot of uh, difficulty in making the movement. The arm or the hand might feel very stiff, impairing motion. There's often some weakness associated with it too. It can affect arms or legs and can affect walking uh, and all motor physical motion activities. Spasms or increased muscle tone result from overactivity of the muscle itself. When spasticity is present uh, for a long period of time, and muscles are kept in a contracted state, the tendons that attach these muscles to the bones that they move will actually become foreshortened over time. And when that occurs, then it may be impossible for the patient to lengthen the muscle or extend the joint that the muscle controls because not only is the muscle tight due to spasticity, but the uh, attachments of the muscle to the bone have shortened, in fact, and, and so then a contracture is said to be present. A spasm can be a spontaneous muscle contraction on top of the altered increased tone of the muscle that is usually present. And a spasm may cause an arm to bend up toward the patient or may cause a leg to bend up toward the patient or straighten out when it's an unwanted movement. And sometimes the spasms can be very violent and could even propel a patient out of a wheelchair or, or off a bed if, if they were extreme. Do many patients experience spasticity as a symptom of MS? Uh, spasticity is an extremely common complaint and problem in patients who have multiple sclerosis. Many patients have involvement of the motor nerves in the central nervous system, as I said before, either the brain or the spinal cord. So it's, it's extremely common. And it impairs walking, it impairs coordination, uh, it can make a patient feel like they're walking in a, in a pool of molasses, if you will. There's such resistance because of the muscles fighting one another as they try and take some steps. Some other things happen too. Sometimes the spasticity creates some tone and contraction of the muscle that allows a patient to stand. Their voluntary control over these muscles isn't as good as it used to be. And every now and then, for reasons we don't fully understand, the spasticity may lessen briefly for moments of time here and there. But when someone has spasticity and depends on it in part, when the tone lessens, patients may sometimes spontaneously fall when they're standing or walking, which can be another problem that spasticity is associated with. Spasticity uh, is always present to some degree in a multiple sclerosis patient who has involvement of the motor nerves of the central nervous system, but there can be times when it will be exacerbated, when it will get worse temporarily. Uh, sometimes this can be uh, when it's particularly cold out and, and winter months are awfully difficult for patients with spasticity as many complain about increased tone and increased stiffness at those periods of time. There, there can be other triggers if patients are, are dehydrated or overheated. Um, that can affect them too. So their general health and well-being may trigger it. Also sometimes some spontaneous activities or even physical therapy to stretch and try and help the patient may at times induce a spasm. Um, there, there are many potential triggers that can temporarily worsen it, but there's always some spasticity present when a patient has motor nerve involvement in the brain and spinal cord. How does a patient know if spasticity is due to the MS or to something else? It is possible uh, to distinguish muscle contraction, muscle activity from spasticity as opposed to something called restless leg syndrome, which is a, a separate and distinct entity. In spasticity, the muscle contraction is completely involuntary. 
and is spontaneously produced by the abnormalities in the central nervous system. In restless leg syndrome, patients truly have an urge to move, an uncontrollable urge to move, and, and it's this urge that results in the movement. Uh, they can't help it, but there's a subtle difference between that and the truly involuntary movement that spasticity itself induces. When patients have circulatory disorders that might impair blood flow to muscle, uh, muscles may in fact have cramps in them, severe cramps, and, and spasms. This is usually associated with physical activity. So patients may be unable to walk more than 10 feet or 20 feet or a block or a block and a half, when, and at which time then they may get cramps or spasms in their legs, but that's readily distinguished from true spasticity. What are some of the effects of spasticity? Now, spasticity can have many adverse effects on a patient. Um, there can be trouble with ambulation, walking. Um, the legs can be very stiff, and, and, and they can ha use an awful lot of energy to go 10 feet. Um, I think that's one of the biggest problems that patients have, is that modest amounts of activity require tremendous amounts of energy, and so fatigue is an extremely common problem. If a person is trying to sleep at night and they have spasticity, they may get spontaneous spasms, as we've talked about, uh, that can be painful. And sometimes spasticity is associated with quite a bit of pain. If any, many people have experienced a muscle cramp at some time or other, and a severe one will get your attention. And in fact, you can't do anything until you have relieved it. And patients with spasticity may be subject to those types of cramps and spasms uh, more than any other type of individual. Uh, and, and so that can be very disruptive to their everyday life, to their rest, to their sleep, let alone their walking and their physical activities. Dr. Barone, is spasticity treatable? Well, spasticity can be managed and can be helped. There uh, are a number of oral medications that can be taken in an effort to reduce the amount of spasticity that a patient experiences. One of the most commonly used medications that we've had for a few decades now is baclofen, uh, an oral medication taken in varying doses from 10 to 20 milligrams, two, three to four times a day, sometimes a little more can be used. It's very effective in many individuals. Um, it is not a perfect medicine. We don't have a perfect medicine to treat this, but it gives satisfactory results in many patients, and it's worthwhile trying as a first-line treatment. Sedation can be a side effect of it, but it's not usually too bad. Um, tolerability to this medication is often very good. We do have another medication available, well, a couple of others, but, but one other one that's particularly good can be tizanidine. Tizanidine is a newer medicine than baclofen. It is also oral, can be taken in two to four milligram doses, three or four times a day. It also can relax muscles. It tends to be a little more sedating in my experience, and that sometimes can limit the dosing that you can use. An older medicine called diazepam, the, the, the brand name was Valium, and, and it's used as an anti-anxiety medicine, but it's a pretty good medicine for reducing muscle spasms and spasticity. Sometimes that's a reasonable adjunctive medication to use. Uh, when we get beyond that, if patients are still having problems, we have a, a couple of other strategies. If patients do fairly well with the oral medications, but there are some localized areas that are still too spastic, for example, the muscles that, that pull the legs together, I sometimes have patients whose legs are kind of stuck together and can't be separated, which can be a problem for walking, but also in non-ambulatory patients, it can affect their daily care and their hygiene and their ability to be cleaned and cared for properly. We can use medication called Botox into spastic muscles. And Botox has become famous as, as a cosmetic therapy, but in fact neurologists developed it to treat movement disorders and then spasticity. So Botox can be used for that. And there are other areas too where localized increased spasm can be adequately handled with Botox. You cannot treat an entire leg or arm or two legs with Botox because you can't use enough of the medication. It is injectable and it has to be injected every three months. Now, if you get beyond the point where there's local spasticity and someone just has severe spasticity throughout the legs or the arms 
and the oral medications are just not doing the job and you just can't use enough Botox to handle it, then these patients are candidates for the baclofen pump. Uh, there is a pump that can be implanted under the patient's skin and a small tube can be inserted into the spinal canal. It's not a difficult procedure, it's not a major surgery, but it is a surgery. And then baclofen in a liquid form can be slowly pumped into the spinal fluid. When it is given that way, it is far more effective. And in fact, the total dose given can be much less. So side effects and sedation are much less when you use the baclofen pump. Before a pump is inserted, patients will generally go through a test dose done via a spinal tap, and then the medicine is injected directly into the spinal fluid and the patient uh, is observed to see the effect of the medicine. And hopefully if you see a good effect without any negative effects, then you know the patient is going to do well when the pump is inserted. So you don't have to insert the pump before you can get a, a reasonable idea of how well they're going to do. The pump has some negatives. It's surgery. You can have bleeding when you have surgery. You can have infections when you have surgery. The pump has to be maintained, and about every three months, the pump has to be filled, and that's generally done via an injection through the skin into a reservoir in the pump. But it is manageable, and for some patients, it makes a very great difference and provides great comfort for them. And in fact, in past years, we had been using the pump more to treat bedridden and chair-ridden patients who had severe spasticity, and we weren't using it as much in ambulatory, still walking patients. But the trend now is to use it a little earlier in patients who aren't doing well with the oral medicine, and we will use it in ambulatory patients, and it can make a very big difference for them as well. Along with the medications, are there other treatment options for patients with spasticity? In addition to the medications that we have discussed for spasticity, uh, there is a very significant role for physical therapy and exercise. I think that stretching exercises are very important. Patients who cannot stretch on their own can be stretched by a caregiver. And maintaining a range of motion in the joints and in the muscles is important. You want to do all you can to prevent the development of the contractures that we have discussed because once they develop, pain can be a sometimes permanent part of the, of the disorder, and that's to be avoided at all costs. Patients who are able to exercise on their own should stretch on their own. They can do land-based exercises, and for anyone fortunate enough to have access to a swimming pool, in-water exercises are just wonderful for MS patients, and uh, I think that patients need to do their part in managing spasticity. It's possible to use some bracing devices to help manage spasticity as well. Some patients will have spasticity to cause their hands to curl up, and I think it's necessary to treat the spasticity with medications or Botox, as we have talked about, but sometimes that won't keep them in a good position. And remember, one of our goals is to stop contractures from happening. So some of my occupational therapy colleagues may make braces to kind of keep the hands and fingers in a good position for long periods of time during the day if, in fact, the patient can't do that on their own. Another thing that might be helpful is that when patients have spasticity affecting the legs and yet they're still able to walk, the spasms of the muscles of the calf tend to pull the foot and the toes down toward the floor. So when they walk, they tend to drag the balls of the feet or their toes on the ground, and it's easy to catch the toe, trip, and fall. So braces can be made to support the ankle and the back of the lower leg and under the foot to keep the foot in a more neutral position to prevent the toes from dragging and falling. So that may be a useful thing to do in some patients as well. Uh, that would be a supplement to treating the underlying spasticity because you have to loosen the muscles somehow with the other therapies that we've discussed. But that brace may help a spastic gait to some extent in some patients and can be kept in mind. And finally, Dr. Barone, what advice can you give to patients who are affected by spasticity? 
Some patients with severe spasticity have a very obvious problem, but others may have milder forms, and they may be bothered by cramps and spasms and yet not look that bad when they walk or engage in motor activities. If patients have these symptoms, they should bring it up to their doctors. They may, in fact, be having early symptoms of spasticity before it becomes very obvious, and they can be treated at those times as well. And I think treating early is a good idea. Patients should keep in mind that spasticity is a manageable problem. It's often associated with MS, though there are other conditions that cause it too. But for our purposes, the patients with MS should know it's very common. If they have the problem, they're not alone. They're among the majority of patients who have multiple sclerosis. And there's a variety of things that can be done to improve the quality of life to reduce the pain associated with it, and to increase function that would otherwise be more impaired by the spasticity. So, so the take-home message is don't live with your spasticity without trying some means to alleviate it. Many of the techniques we have are very helpful and can improve your quality of life, and that's a very important thing. Thank you so much. Well, that concludes our segment on managing spasticity. On behalf of MSAA, I would like to thank Dr. Barone for providing us with this valuable information on such an important topic. MSAA would also like to thank the Medtronic Foundation for its support of this segment. This concludes the MSAA educational web video, A Closer Look at Multiple Sclerosis Symptoms, Part 1. For MSAA, thank you for watching.